Wow, it is really, really cool to be here. Uh, Raquel, you and your team just put on a great event. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. All right. So, so the prayers and promises um, of Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, basically the way I see them is the prayers are about making an effort uh, making an effort to align with the spiritual life. So if we want to enter the realm of the spirit, I really think prayer is absolutely necessary. And the promises, the promises are the things that come true when we do the work of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, one of the things that, that I see that, uh, that makes me a little sad is there's a lot of people who don't know the depths of Alcoholics Anonymous. They don't, know, they don't know how much gold there is to find in Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, and I'm telling you, this thing is a thousand miles deep. And the promises really are the carrot, you know, that Bill holds out to us and promises us if we, if we do this work. Now, um, you know, I want to qualify a little bit. I'm an alcoholic. Um, I discovered alcohol, that I was an alcoholic in Alcoholics Anonymous, basically because I just, I just didn't have a, a definition of what alcoholism was. I, I, knew, I knew that on occasion I would become overserved. Uh, but, but, uh, but, you know, I, I mean, if you would have asked me what is going on with you, I would have said something like, I party, man, you, you know. Meanwhile, I'm, you know, I'm drinking my life into the toilet. So I, I, really, I really didn't understand uh, what was going on. And, and I'm really, really thankful for, uh, for the, the foundational members of Alcoholics Anonymous uh, understanding what I'm up against, what I was up against, like the real problem. And explaining that so well in the book Alcoholics Anonymous and then offering, offering a, way, a way out. You know, um, y yesterday I was doing a, a, a favor for, for my wife. She bought a, a coffee table that opens up and does all this stuff, right? And of course, when you buy furniture today, it comes in a big box and you gotta put it together. And it was funny, there were, there were, there were 12 sets of instructions with pictures. And you know, number one, number two, and I learned long ago to actually pay attention to directions. You know, for the for the longest time, you know, directions are for idiots, and I would put everything together wrong. But but I've learned I've learned to follow really closely, you know, the instructions. And so as I went through uh, uh, instruction one through twelve, at twelve I had a complete coffee table that worked the way it was supposed to, and it wasn't going to fall apart when I moved it. So I look, at, I look at the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous today the same way. What do the 12 steps build for us? They build for us an experience in the realm of the spirit. And that's completely different than what I was experiencing when I was drinking. You know, the uh, two things I learned really, really quickly uh, when I showed up in Alcoholics Anonymous, and they were significant enough for me to understand I needed to stay with you. I needed to stay here. I needed to take this as a big piece of business. And those were um, uh, the first step, uh, the first step principles. Uh, one of them was I got it right away. I understood right away uh, the, the phenomenon of craving, the allergy to alcohol. How it would present in me is the first drink would ask for the second. The second would insist on the third. The third would demand the fourth. So once I started drinking, I wanted the 30th drink more than I wanted the 29th. It just, it create, and, th and this, was a diff this was different than a lot of the people I drank with. A lot of the people I drank with would have two or three beers and they were good. What would happen is if there was still alcohol, I was still drinking. And that caused, that caused a lot of, you know, a lot of problems in my life. So once alcohol's in my body, you know, 
move the furniture back, turn the phone off. I, you know, I'm, don't be calling me up and asking me to help you move or something. I, I'm, I'm drinking. So, so that was pretty easy for me to un understand. It was a heavy lift for me to fully concede that I had the obsession of the mind. Now, it's, there's chapters on this in the book because it, it's difficult. It's a, it's a difficult admission. It's an admission of defeat, you know, but it's a necessary admission. And what that is is I can't not drink. On my own, unedited will, in an unrecovered state, Alcohol is going to go back in my body. Doesn't mean doesn't matter if the judge says I'm going to go back to jail. Doesn't matter if she says she's going to leave. Doesn't matter if the boss says I'm going to be fired. Doesn't matter if I'm going to lose my license for another 10 years. None of that stuff is sufficient defense against alcohol going back in my body in an unrecovered state. So so once I once I understood that I knew I needed to stay with you. Now, now, here's the thing I think that fits better into uh, the prayers and promises of Alcoholics Anonymous, and that's after the dash, that, that our lives had become unmanageable. Now, there's been a real evolution in my understanding and experience with this. My first look at, yeah, my life is unmanageable, you know, I... You know, I'm living at home with mom with a hundred dollar car. I, I mean, it was it was external, right? My my unmanageability was I saw it as external. Today I see it as as internal. So my emotional life is unmanageable. My spiritual life is non-existent. And what's going on is I am in a toxic experience of self-consciousness. And that leads to an unmanageable life. So, so what, is, what is that toxic experience of, of, uh, of self-consciousness? What does it look like on Chris? Well, it looks like I, I'm, I'm trapped in my head. I have, a, I have a mind that wants to kill me. And, and what it does is it, it, is it makes me so emotionally uncomfortable, I can't stand it. And it does it by continually rehashing things from the past. I am continually dwelling on injustices that were done to me. People that did me wrong and made me feel small. And bosses that, you know, didn't appear. And, and you know, I'm, I'm constantly, like, I can't believe, you know, like, that, that son of a bitch, you know, I, I, you know, 10 years ago, you know. You, you know? And, 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 like, these, these are the trains of thought that are going through my head almost constantly. And, and, and it's, it's painful and uncomfortable. But I don't know any different because that's the way it's always been, right? And if, if, I'm, not, if I'm not dwelling on the past, I have, I have waves of anxiety about the future. You know, I, I, cre I create scenarios in my head about what tomorrow's going to be like or what going here is going to be like or what participating in that is going to be like. You know, I oh, know, no, no, tomorrow, tomorrow's going to, you know, I'm, so my boss is going to yell at me, you know, because I, I started a fire, you know, at the client's house and, you know, he's going to yell at me and I'm going to have to yell back because I'm not going to take that crap and, you know, and then I'm probably going to have to hit him, you know, and, and if I hit him, you, you know, he's going to fire me and you know, if he fires me, I'm not going to have any money. I mean, you know, this is, this is the stuff that's, that's going through my head when I first show up and, and sit down in a chair with you. That's what, that's, what's, that's what's the turmoil of my emotional life. And it's really based on, it's based on this experience of self-consciousness. Now, Bill Wilson understood the real problem with alcohol, and he made it very, very clear he said, selfishness and self-centeredness, that we think is the root of our troubles. We're self-will run riot, though we usually don't think so. Various manifestations of self are what had defeated us. We must be rid of this selfishness or it kills us. He's very clear. Now, I read that a hundred times 
before it really sunk in that that really is what my alcoholism is. That's what I need to recover from, right? So, so, so this, is the, this is the first step as, as I see it today, as I experience it today. The first step is alive and well within me. I know a lot more about what I'm up against today than, than I have in, in the past. And I don't want to live like that anymore. It is really, it, it robs all quality from life to be wrapped up in, in, that, in that emotional bondage of self that he describes in the first chapters of, of the book. Now, in the doctor's opinion, uh, the doctor, who I don't really think was a very religious man, and, and, I, and he looked, Dr. Silkworth like looked at, you know, I'll describe it like this. Uh, so there was a program on TV a long time ago that I used to watch all the time. It was called The Wild Kingdom. Does anybody remember that? And there was this, they, they, they highlighted this woman, uh, Jane Goodall, I think her name was, right? And, uh, and she went down to Africa and she integrated herself into the gorilla gr clans. So she would go and she, a little bit at a time, you know, she'd move in and finally the gorillas are okay with her, you know, and, and, and she's, she's a behavioralist. So she's studying the behavior of all these gorillas and, you know, she's writing it all down. Uh, you, you know, so, so Dr. Silkworth, <laughs> he wasn't an alcoholic, but he's treating like 20,000 alcoholics. So he's sitting there, he's writing stuff down, <laughs> you know, like, like, you did what? <laughs> You know, you you said what? And he, 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 he's like he's like the same kind of same kind of person. And when he saw when he saw all of a sudden a whole bunch of these alcoholics not drinking anymore, cleaning up and showing up, and putting their lives back together, he paid he paid attention to that. So so he asks us at the end of at the end of. Uh, his writing in the big book, I, I hope you stay to pray. Now, now my first experience with prayer in AA, I was maybe six months sober, and I got a call that was, it was like a threatening call from, from an old girlfriend, you know, she was going to send these guys over to, to beat the crap out of me, you know, so it was like, you know, I, I didn't really date well, you know, my last couple of couple of years of, uh, of, of uh, drinking, you, you, you know, if you can imagine. And uh, I got what I could get. And, and there, that, that wasn't, you know, there wasn't a lot of quality. So anyway, she, you know, she's mad about something and she's going to send a bunch of people over to beat me up. So, so I, I go over to my, my sponsor's house. I go, Phil, Phil, you know, they're, they're going to come get me. They're going to come get me. And like a good sponsor, he goes, huh, I want to see you a meeting, in a meeting tonight. And do you pray, Chris? And I, I'm like, pray? Pray? What do you mean do I pray? What's that got to do with it? I need guns. You, 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 know, you know? And, uh, and so, so, he, so, so that's like my first experience. Now, now I, I really respected my, my sponsor. I, saw, I had him on such a pedestal because he was sober and God, I needed to be sober. You know what I mean? And he had, he had a house, and his children lived with him still, and he had a job and a, a brand new car, all, all, all the stuff, all the stuff that made him look, you know, solid. And, uh, and that was really the first notice I got that we in Alcoholics Anonymous, Chris, we pray. And, uh, and so I started to pay attention to that, and I started to uh, slowly, what, what happens is when you come in and you experience things, I was experiencing the fellowship, right? I was experiencing a lot of discussion meetings and, you know, we, we, you know I was starting to make friends. And what will happen is if, if you're lucky, there'll be an evolution, uh, an evolution that will happen. You will start to come to believe 
that some of this stuff that you discounted or didn't think was for you, you'll, you'll, start, you'll start to accept some of it and, and the change will start to take place. You'll come to believe in a power. I had come to believe in my sponsor and I'd come to believe in Alcoholics Anonymous, but I was still really skeptical about there being a spiritual power that could do anything for me. You know, you know, it's not like I didn't believe in God, but I thought God was like a cosmic Alan Funt. You know, like, like he was up in heaven. Oh, oh man, this will be, St. Peter, this will be good. You know, uh, Chris, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have Chris take three quaaludes and then drive to the, drive to the police station and ask for directions. Ho, <laughs> ho, You know, because there was like one debacle after another. And if, if, there's a, if there's a divine presence, you know, he's messing with me. So, so that's the insane perception I had uh, on, on a power uh, greater, greater than myself. Now, now, coming to believe in this power, there's a lot of things, because I've worked with a lot of people, there's a lot of preconceived notions about this, this, this spirit of the universe, this God of our own understanding. There's a lot of, there's a lot of preconceived notions that, that most of us come in with. And the set-aside prayer is beautiful because it's asking us to set those aside for a new experience. If, if, we're gonna, if we're gonna recover from alcohol, alcoholism, if we're gonna escape that toxic self-centeredness and move into uh, the realm of the spirit, we're gonna have to be open to a lot of things that we, we might not be open to. Uh, this, this concept of, of God. And really, you know, I, I, had, I had a lot of ups and downs in the early years about, you know, coming, coming to terms with this spirit. But, you know, you know what I had a lot of? I had a lot of evidence. So, so, so maybe I was confused a little bit about the attributes of God and, and, and you know, definitions. And, you know, I, there's always a lot of questions. But what I had was I had evidence, and my evidence was you. I was watching so many people get better. I was watching people coming off the street, you know, and putting it all together. And, and in step one, if I admit that I'm powerless over alcohol and I'm powerless over this unmanageability, you know, the, the stuff that's going through my head, if I'm powerless over that, the, the solution has to be power, power of some sort. So, so I had a lot of evidence that, that the spiritual life is exactly what I need. And slowly, slowly I started to buy into it and I started to do, you know, I started to do more things. I, I started a morning prayer routine. I started an evening uh, prayer review routine. I started to do uh, some of those things. And, and it, in almost every instruction in the 12 steps, there's a series of promises that uh, will manifest if, if we work for them. You know, the, these promises... Uh, will uh, will come come to life in your life if you uh, if if you work for them and um, and there's negative promises too there's promises that say if you don't do this or if you skip this vital step or you know if you remain agnostic you're you know you're probably in for a world of hurt there's there, there's three guys in my life uh, uh, right now who I'm, I'm just I don't folks I don't care I'm gonna stick by these guys they're they're like lifers with me and and you know they're drinking and using and causing all this kind of trouble but but uh, but there's one thing all three have in common and that's entrenched agnosticism. They're waiting for the proof. You know, they want the proof. 
when the proof is right in front of them. The proof is in this room. So, so and what happens, with, what happens with these people is they get a lot of time and some things, get, some things fall into place. And, uh, and they build up a bright future uh, and outlook for, their, for themselves and their families. And it all comes crashing down in a series of sprees. And, and I'm, watching this, I'm watching this happen all over. Now, what I think, what I think the problem is, is their conception of God. Because we, we can come up with a conception of God that just doesn't make any sense. My, my early conception was, uh, was God is, uh, he's, he's in white robes with a long beard, you know, sitting up in a cloud in heaven, and St. Peter's next to him with a harp, and he's taking notes on all, all the things that the, the, the Chris guy is doing wrong, you know, and, and, and when I die, I'm going to go up there, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to face that, I'm going to have to face those sins, and it's going to be purgatory at best, you know, if not, if not the burning fires of hell forever. And, and I got to tell you, I can't stay sober with, with a conception like that. Where did that, where did that conception come from? It, it came from, it came from, uh, you know, bad Sunday school teachers or something. It came from me just developing it myself, uh, hanging out with some kids. I, I don't know. But today I have, a, I have a conception of God that is loving power, a power, because I have seen this power work in you and through you and do for you what you cannot do for yourself. And I've seen this power work, I've experienced this power work in me and through me and do for me what I cannot work for, uh, what I cannot do for myself. Now, now, in step three, step three is uh, is a decision, and I. So, some of the language in the book Alcoholics Anonymous, some of the definitions of some of the terms in Alcoholics Anonymous, we see differently today. Uh, uh, we just, you know, it's it's almost a different definition. But when when they called for a decision in step three. What a decision was back then was it, it included follow through. So today I can decide to go to the store and get busy and not go to the store. But the way they, the way they described the decision was if you decided to go to the store, you, you're, you know, you're going to the store 100%. So, so I need to decide to accept the spiritual life as my solution to alcoholism. Uh, it, you know, if, if I'm powerless over alcohol and I'm powerless over my emotional state and, and I got a mind that wants to kill me, I, you know, there's really no choice. I'm, I must accept a power that can, that can separate me from alcohol and I must accept a power that will that will help me return to some kind of sanity, I, I, I have to. I have to. And, and in step three, uh, I make that decision. And there's prayers. There's prayers all throughout it. God, I offer myself to thee. Uh, and there's promises. You, you know, you, you, you will start to, you'll start to feel, you'll start to feel some of the spiritual world. You'll f start to experience some of the realm of the spirit. As you as you move through, as you move through this stuff. Now, I want I want to share uh, I want to share something that um, was very very relevant to me just recently, uh, whether it's appropriate or not. Any any anyway. Uh, so so there was somebody that handed me a book. Now, yeah, we we hand people books, we recommend books, and everyone you know I'm I'm usually okay. But uh, but this book was recommended to me, and uh, and you know I'm gonna I'm gonna follow uh, basic traditions and guidelines, and not mention the, the name of this book. But all right, it's it's called God the Bestseller, and uh, 
And I want to share a little bit about this story because it was so significant to me. And it has to do, believe it or not, with, uh, with the spiritual life. So the story in this book is this. Uh, this guy's a book dealer. He buys, uh, he buys collections of books. He buys um, um, estate books, you know, a uh, real high-end book dealer, and that's how he makes his money. And there's a family out on Cape Cod that is, uh, that's bugging him. You got to come out. You got to come out. We got some really good books. And it's kind of a long haul for him, you know, so he's putting it off, putting it off. Finally, he goes out there. And as he walks into the house and he starts to look at the books, he is like, oh, my God. God, he, it's, it's, the, it's the most significant collection of spiritual and religious books he's ever seen in his life. And most of them are signed by the author. He's looking through them, right? He's like, who, who, who is this guy? Who, who lived here, right? And, uh, and they tell him. And, and he gets really interested, and he digs in, and, he, and the, the, the guy that lived in this house never threw anything away. So he starts looking through personal papers, and he starts to find all this stuff out. And what this individual was, was he was, uh, from, from the mid-20s to the mid-60s, he was the religion editor for Harper's Publishing, okay? So, so this is the individual who colored our perception of religious understanding in the 20th century because he was the one picking the authors. He was the one who was deciding which, ne which is going to be the next bestseller in the religion department. Now, uh, he, he published, I'll just name a few of the people he published. He published a million people, but he, pub he published Martin Luther King Jr. He published Albert Schweitzer. He published Hurd, Huxley, Dorothy Day, all these different people who, the thing they had in common was, yes, they were deeply spiritual, but they also accomplished really, really great things. And as the guy's digging through all this information, he starts to find a whole bunch of stuff on Bill Wilson. Come to find out, him and Bill Wilson were, were like this. I didn't know it until I read this book, but he put together, he put together the initial publication of the 12 Steps and 12 Traditions and AA Comes of Age. And because Bill was his buddy, he made a deal with him that Works Publishing could publish it all in perpetuity. But him and Harper's were the, the people that formatted those two books, and he, he, was, he was part of the, the editorial oversight. So, so as I'm going through this book, uh, it's on Axman, but he's, tr he's finding out that this guy Axman, not only would he publish these people and, and, and was friends with them, but they had deep spiritual practices. They would get together and they would meet and they would fellowship, all these amazing people and authors. And, and they'd go on meditation retreats. And what book are you reading? You know, what type of uh, meditation practices do you have? And, and they, they grew spiritually together and Bill was right in there with them. So what does this story have to do, you know, with the first three steps? In step three, we make a decision to engage in the spiritual life and hopefully continue to grow, to grow in this and, and search and experience. And what Axman and Bill and all these guys were where they were experiential spiritualists. So, so you, think, you think about religion, right? Re that religion can be devotional. You, you, can, you can go to church and, and follow all that stuff, and all that stuff is a really great experience. That's devotional. The experiential stuff, those are the guys who go really deep in. Those are the mystics. Those are the people who want to go all the way in and 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 there's a lot of gold here. I'm going to keep digging. And that's what Bill did the rest of his life. And I believe that's what he's asking us to do in, uh, in, step, in step three. In step three. Now, I'm going to, um, I'm going to tell one story. This is another thing that may not have anything to do with my topic. 
Uh, but I like, I like the way I tell it, so, so I'm, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and do it. Um, all right, so, so what, I do, what I did for a living, what my career was based on was I, I was a facility manager. And what I would do is uh, I would run the facilities departments for pharmaceutical manufacturing and research and development sites. Some of the jobs were big, some of them were small, some of them were really big. Uh, and and I, you know, I, was the, I was the guy that would, uh, would be in charge of, of all this stuff. Well, COVID hits, right? Uh, which was quite an quite a initial disaster for all of us, right? What do, you, what do you mean, what do you mean we can't go to our meetings anywhere anymore, you know? Like disaster. But, we, but, but we're resilient, right? We, we found our way onto Zoom and, you know, we, we were upside down and we didn't know how to mute and we took, it, took the laptop into the bathroom with us and, you know, we, we did all that stuff. But, but we, were resi- we, were, we were resilient, right? Well, anyway, you know, I'm, I'm, like, I'm, I'm like furloughed, you know, when COVID hits and I was never unfurloughed. So as time goes by, I, you know, I start to make the decision that, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to retire, Right, I'm gonna I'm gonna step back, and uh, and I did. You know, I turned Social Security on and Medicare and all that stuff. I'm at that age, and uh, folks, there's something I like to do more than anything in the world. Um, you know, you know what that is? Nothing. <laughs> I love doing nothing. You ever just sit on a couch, like stare into space? You know that. I'm telling you, there's something meditative about that. There's something very deeply spiritual about nothing. So it's hard to convince other people, but but and uh, and one of the people I never did convince was uh, was my wife. So she wa- she walks in de- in one day and she goes, "What are you doing?" I'm like, "Nothing." <laughs> She's like, "Nothing, nothing. There's a whole list of stuff that you know for you to do around the house." I'm like, okay, okay, you don't have to keep reminding me every six months. So, uh, so I, started, I started to look around, you know, for something to do. I'm able-bodied. I started to look around for something to do. And uh, I certainly didn't want one of those big pharmaceutical jobs again. You know, they, they suck the life out of you. But, uh, but I was open. So all of, a sudden, uh, all of a sudden, a job opened up. And it was right down the street from me. And it was a facility manager job, and, uh, and it was for a hospice. So I apply for this, right? And I go down there, and they, they hire me. Obviously, I've got a decent resume. They hire me. And I start working there. And, uh, and, and I, I got to tell you, I've, I, th- I think I finally got a job that I love, right? I love this job. And, and, and they love me. I don't know why, but they do. Anyway, uh, so... So I'm in charge of four buildings, and my office is in a 10-bed inpatient hospice. And after I'm there a while, you know, I I get everything under control, and I've got a little bit of uh, a bandwidth. You know, I start start looking around. I start to notice something. You know who ends up in hospice? We do. We do. We're not hard to spot. Uh, liver cancer, lung cancer, esophagus cancer, you know, a lot of smoking related stuff. We're not, we're not hard to spot. So I started to pay attention to these people and I started to go in and talk to them. You know, it's like the facility guy is, is in talking with this guy. But I started to do it and they let me do it. And, uh, and, and, I, and I, I got more and more involved. Now, this is about five months ago now. There were three people in the 10 bed inpatient who were alcoholics. There was a woman who was about to celebrate her 40th anniversary, you know, in the hospice. And I got a cake for her, her family came. We did a, we did a, like a, like a Southern California happy birthday thing for her 40th, uh, 40th anniversary. And she just was so happy about that. Um, and there was someone in there who wasn't really going to make it, but there was someone in there with uh, advanced cirrhosis of the liver, really, really bad cirrhosis of the liver, and she'd come in to check out. This was a young, young woman, and I, I'd go in and I'd talk to her, uh, and it was, it was very, very valuable for me to, uh, to, to share some stuff with her, but, 
but I have a home group that's not far away, and I asked, I asked her this question. I go, um, would it be okay, would it be okay if, uh, if I brought some of the women from the home group in to talk with you? And she's like, yes, yes, that would be fine. And so I go to the, I go to the meeting, and, and I, I make, anybody have an announcement? I got an announcement, I need women, you know, for, <laughs> for a commitment. And, uh, and six women, uh, you know, uh, go, well, what is this about? And I go, well, I want you to come down to an inpatient hospice. And their first experience, their first reaction is like, why, <laughs> you know? What good is that gonna do? And, uh, and I, go, I go, they're asking, they're asking for, for they're, they're, they're reaching out their hand. Uh, I, you know, w would you do it? And six of them uh, said yes, and, and they showed up there. Now, the woman who was celebrating 40 years was happy as a clam to have a meeting. She was just so happy about that. But these women went in and sat with the young lady with, with the advanced cirrhosis. And listen, she'd gone in there to check out. She was in yellow. It just she was bad shape, right? And they all got around her, and they all started sharing. And I got to tell you, I, I'm, I swear to God, there was a change that day in this young lady. There was a change. And, and the women walked out of there. They, the experience they had, you know, carrying the message in a hospice was something they'd never experienced before. And this, this one woman who had like 30 years said, Chris, that was the most significant experience I've ever had in Alcoholics Anonymous, what, what we just did. And so they, they all started to come back and they started to, they started to wrap themselves around, especially this woman with the cirrhosis. And I saw a change. She started to fight. Now, a couple months go by, AA is in and out, the nurses are like, it's the AAs again, you know? <laughs> what did you do, Chris? And, and, and a couple months go by, and, and there's, there's a Zoom call that's gonna be very, very important. This woman is gonna ask the question, am I a candidate for the transplant, a liver transplant? You know, that's what she's fighting for. And so the AAs are there, the nurses are there, we're, you know, we're all sitting around the Zoom call and she asked, she asked the surgeon on the Zoom call the question, can I get on the transplant list? And the surgeon goes, we're not gonna put you on the transplant list. And she goes, why? And the surgeon goes, cause we're looking at your labs. You're getting better. I, 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 I swear to God, it was, it was less than two months later, we walked her out of there. You know, can you imagine? Now, now this whole experience blew me away. I, I, you know, because of this, once more, once more, I see the promise of a power greater than ourselves doing for us what we cannot do for ourselves working in and through the women in that group. The power worked through those women. I saw it happen. You know what I mean? And, and, and so, so do these promises, do these promises come true? They come true if we work for them. They come true if we do our job in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, they, they come true if we do our job in Alcoholics Anonymous. Now there's, there's one, one story Peter made me promise to, to share with you here today. <laughs> and it, it, go, it goes back into my drinking, right? Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna finish with this. But, um, so and it has to do with New York too. Um, so this is the 1970s, I'm, I'm drinking like, like, a, like a fish and and, but there was, there was some fun things I was still able to do back in the 70s. I could still get out of the house, you know, in the 70s. And, uh, and what we would do in New Jersey, we were about an hour outside of Manhattan, is we would go in on the weekend. And, and if anybody who's been, who was in New York City in the 70s understands something, there was some cool music going on at that period of time, right? I mean, you would go in one night and it would be Led Zeppelin, you know, you'd go in the, the next night, you know, it'd be Little Feet, you'd go in the next night, it'd be The Who, you know, you'd go in the next weekend, it'd be The Grateful Dead, and, and, and we, you know, we saw, we saw some amazing stuff. 
Now, as an alcoholic though, one of the things that I did was I drank to go drinking. Anybody in here ever drink to go drinking? Oh, we're going out drinking later? Well, I'll get started right now, thanks, right? And I remember me and my buddy John are drinking to go drinking in the city. And, uh, and we went to this concert, and I think, it, I think it was a Fog Hat Wishbone Ash concert. I, I can't really be sure, but, but, uh, but we go in there, and we're good and drunk as we sit down for this concert. And, uh, and John comes back from the bathroom, and he goes, he goes, hey, man, they're selling LSD in the bathroom. You want to get some and do it? And there's really only one appropriate answer to that if you're partying and going to concerts, right? And that's, yeah. So, so what we do is, is we go in and we, we, buy, uh, we buy a couple of hits of blotter or whatever, we take it, and we allow like two songs to go by, and then we, we ask each other, are you, are you high? Is, is it working? No, I don't, I don't feel anything. Uh, we must have got ripped off. Well, there's more people in there. Let's let's go back. Let's go back and buy more. So, uh, so we go back and we buy more and we take that and we let another couple of songs go by. And uh, and we're like, yeah, it's still not, still nothing, still nothing. You know, drunker than hoots. Uh, let let's try it one more time. One more time. We'll go. You know, so one more time we go back and, and we buy and we buy acid from these disreputable looking characters in the bathroom. Now, all I, can, all I can tell you is this, is the concert is over and they're turning on the lights and we are like this. I mean, I mean, so, so we are so overdosed on, on LSD. And, and if that's never happened to you, the best way I can describe it is, uh, imagine Disney World being injected into your eye with a turkey baster. You, you, you know, like, like, I didn't know, I didn't know all the people in here were Muppets, you, you, you know? I mean, it's just crazy. And, uh, and I remember the lights are going up and, and we have to leave, right? And so we're like, must, must stand up, must, must walk, must walk down aisle, must, must leave venue, you know? You know? And, uh, and we had all driven in in a, in a van, so, uh, so we all pile in this van. I remember like curling up in a fetal position, saying, don't lose your mind, don't lose your mind, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and, when, and when you go from Manhattan to New Jersey, uh, you know, the, the, the most appropriate way is through a tunnel, right? And, uh, and so, so we're, we're all higher than you can imagine, and, and we're he heading down to the Lincoln Tunnel, and it's like eight lanes, six lanes, four lanes, two lanes tunnel. And we're almost at the tunnel, and somebody toward the front of the van goes, hey, man, we'll never fit, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, so, and so we get concerned. Some of us get concerned, and, you know, we move toward the front of the van, and, and we become convinced, too, you know? I mean, it, it looks like a mouse hole, and, uh, and so, you ever try to back out of the Lincoln Tunnel? Took us like 45 minutes, and uh, and there's some people who aren't afraid of laying on their horn, you, you know, you know, in in the city. I gotta tell you, we took the bridge, and and made it back safe somehow. But you know, this is the, this is the kind of stuff that was going on in my life. It was absolutely crazy. Do I live a better life now? You know, have I experienced these promises? Do I pray like crazy? Absolutely. Have I experienced these promises? Yes. And what that's done is that has moved me from that experience of self-consciousness into what I can describe today as God consciousness, where everything is good. All is well. That's, re that's really the best promise in the world. You get to a place where all is well. And, uh, and I want to, I wanna, I, again, I want to thank Raquel and the team uh, for doing this. I want to thank Roger for being uh, the engineer and recording this and, and uh, alerting me to the fact that I was about to stand up here with my pants unzipped. Th thank you, Roger. Uh, 
I, I, we're friends now forever. And, uh, and, you know, thank you all for being here. What did I tell you guys? All right, so we're going to be back in exactly 15 minutes, so you know we're starting 11.30 sharp, so just... <laughs>